Hey, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. Absolutely. Glad, uh, glad you could join us. Uh, I always like to start these uh, episodes out by understanding how you got started in the industry. So I'd love to hear your story. Sure. It's, it's an interesting story. Uh, actually, before I got in the industry, I was a correctional officer. I thought that I was going to go into law enforcement. Okay. Um, my, my parents were in law enforcement, so I decided, Hey, I'll, I'll go down that road. I was, uh, working at a correctional f facility in Cleveland, Ohio. And after about two years of working in the facility, I decided maybe I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and I always had kind of an entrepreneurial spirit and my business partner, um, you know, at, at that time, he was just a friend, said, hey, I have this job working for this company where, you know, we're knocking on doors and handing the lead to a salesperson and they go in and they sell home improvements. What do you think about it? I'm like, well, you do what? And you do, you, you knock on doors and you go in homes and you sell people home improvements. And lo and behold, after a couple of weeks of pitching me on it, I, I took the position, quit my job, and um, eventually became the canvas manager at a, a company called Ohio Consolidated Builders in here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, did really, really well at it. Became a senior uh, canvas manager, managed about 40 different canvassers, and we would go out into neighborhoods strategically, knock on doors, and we would come back with either you know 40 to 80 leads and hand them off to the to the uh, call center where they would set up the appointment for the sales rep. And basically that's how I got started. I, I then went into sales and um, I did very, very well at sales. My first lead ever, I was literally handed a window and a contract and said, hey, you have, a, you have an appointment in Lira, Ohio, go sell. I remember showing up to the house and it was this single uh, female in the backyard with her kids. And I asked her to go to the kitchen table. She refused. I was nervous. And we ended up just doing the demonstration out on our picnic table. Well, after about two hours of talking to her and fending off the kids and, you know, them coming up to her, uh, I asked her for the sale. She, she said no. And then I asked again and finally, you know, she accepted the, uh, the, the, the sale and I got in my car and was like, holy crap, I just sold $6,000 worth of home improvements on my first appointment ever. And I, I remember calling my manager and just was super excited about it. And that high of being in the car, and I'm sure your listeners have experienced this too, but um, you know, that high of being in the car and just turn, cranking up the radio, knowing you, know, you just made $600, $700 in a couple hours. It was something I'll never forget. And it and just she didn't cancel, me. right, Mike? She didn't she, she didn't did cancel. not cancel. <laughs> okay. Did not cancel. She stayed but I actually had a really good um, you know, uh cancellation rate, uh lower than mo most of the sales reps in, in my uh business. But I remember after that, I stayed in that position for a couple of years, and then I had an opportunity to go out to um Maryland and start a furniture company. I remember at, uh, at the time I told my, my sales manager, hey, I, I'm going to go to Maryland. I think I want to do start my own business, and I think it's going to be a furniture company. Went out there, was doing well. At the time, uh, I was engaged to, to my wife of 20 years, and she was going to Cleveland State. I was in Baltimore starting up this furniture company, and we were about to get married, um, she drove, she, she came out to Baltimore to live, live with me and everything was going super. Everything was just set in gold. And then the towers on September 11th, uh, two planes fell, flew into the building and they were hit. And we all just like yourself sat in front of our televisions and said, what, what's going on? What's next? Yeah. And she got really, really homesick. And that's when I called my business partner and of today and i said hey i think i'm coming home because my my wife doesn't want to live out here in baltimore we're doing well but everybody's kind of taking stock and going what are they going to do it was funny because 
Bill, my business partner, said the same thing. Hey, I'm thinking about leaving also. And I told him, hey, I, I, I experienced entrepreneurship. I don't think I can go back working for somebody. Mm-hmm. And he's like, hey, let's sit down and let, let's talk and put something together. And I, we, I remember we, we met at a place called the Clifton Diner in Cleveland, Ohio. And we sat down and we talked about starting a mortgage company. We, we talked about continuing a furniture company. And he threw out there, hey, we both know home improvements. Why don't we just start a home improvement company? We, we, you know how to knock on doors. You know how to sell. I, I've managed a sales force. We both worked in a call center. You know, the only thing we don't have experience on is, is installing windows. Um, but we can get somebody else to do that. So lo and behold, we, we scraped $3,000 together, Tom, to, to start this business, which is now called Universal Windows Direct in 2002. Uh, and today that company is now you know, a $150 million company uh, in Northeast Ohio and across 40 different other platforms, whether it's a retail location or a, uh, uh, a franchise. Wow. Isn't that amazing? It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, probably to hear, probably to tell the story again and to hear it. Yeah. yeah it's like, wow. And you, you know, what's funny is you don't often tell the story. So, yeah. you know, just even thinking back on it it's, and, and, you know, I left out a lot of details, but just crazy how one day I'm working in a jail and the next thing, you know, I'm, I, I started a uh, home improvement company. Yeah. And you, you, it's funny. I've talked to other uh, founders of businesses as well. And uh, you know, if I just think of even Patrick Fingos and he was saying like, you know, he's afraid of heights and he's got a roofing company. <laughs> and it's right. like, it wasn't right. so much about what it was that they were selling or marketing. It was that they, they could sell or market something and they chose home improvement. Yeah. And, 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 and what really attracted both of us to it is it wasn't a little sale either. You know, I mean, to, to do a roof, siding, windows, doors, you know, you're talking a substantial investment and it, it came with payments and, um, the, the, the salespeople had the ability to really earn a nice living. And that's what was really attractive about it. Yeah. So how, how uh, I guess first tell us a little bit more about what Universal Windows Direct does and, and what it looks like today. Sure. Universal Windows Direct, uh, founded in 2002 by myself and business partner, Bill Barr. Um, it, it's a window, siding, and door company mainly. We do other products like gutters and roofs, but 80% of our business is window siding and doors. Founded in 2002, we have nine retail locations stemming uh, as far south as Charlotte. Um, Cleveland was our headquarters. And we also have dealership locations where um, we, we create licensees who can start their own business and we manage and we have about 40 of those. Uh, combined total anywhere between 150 and 200 million if you combine all of it together. Yeah. What? How were you able to grow and scale? Like, what did that look like? I know you didn't just jump out of the gate, you know, and be this big business. Like, what did that scale and growth look like? And were there were there bumps in that road? I mean, did you grow and then step back and grow, or was it just a slow, steady growth all the way up? Or what would that look like? So, it, it, if you look at our trajectory, um, Bill and I really thought we were just going to grow the company through licensees. You know, in our mind, it was going to be easier to teach somebody who had the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, how to run their own business and then, you know, just reap the rewards or rebates from that, so to speak. So from 2006 until 2014, we went the licensee way. And I think at one point in time, Tom, we had 60 licensees across the country. One of the things that we experienced, though, is 80% of them would not listen or do it the way that you thought it should be done. 20% would, and those folks are still with us today, but the other 80% wouldn't. And Bill and I were constantly standing at home shows and and helping these folks out. And, you know, again, I don't want to say that they all didn't follow the, the system, but most of them wouldn't follow the system. And by the time you left, they'd have a bunch of deals up on the board, but two months later, you know, they'd be calling you going, hey, we have no leads. Right around 2014 is when we decided, hey, what if we just started opening up three cell locations? Sorry about that. <laughs> what if we just started opening up retail locations ourselves? And um, that's when we opened up our first retail location in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
and there were a lot of false starts. So anyone thinking about scaling the business and saying, you know, how easy or hard it is, it is not easy. The first one is the hardest. It's, it's kind of a, a place where you run trial and error, see what works, doesn't work. How do you scale the business? You know, think about it. You're running a location hundreds of miles away. Um, and this was before Teams. This was before, you know, all, all, all of the internet got kicked off. And, and you're really trying to run this from afar. And we had a lot of false starts. In fact, there was one year in about, I think it was 2016 or 17, where we were thinking about shutting down Charlotte. We didn't. We hired a new manager down there and we changed a few things in the marketing. And lo and behold, the, the, the store finally took off. And thank God it did, because if it didn't, we may have not continued to grow. Charlotte finally took off. And that's when we we're like, okay, we have this process honed in now and let's open up the next store. And that's when we opened up Indianapolis and then Columbus came quickly after, uh, after Columbus, we opened up in, um, Pittsburgh, uh, Louisville, St. Louis, Chicago. And in fact, today we just opened up four new locations in, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, Northern Virginia, and Northern or Southern Chicago. So Charlotte is kind of where we cut our teeth. So if you look at our trajectory, we literally have done most of our revenue from 2014 to 2022. And that's what, six years? Six years, yeah. You know, six years, we literally went from $10 million to $150 million. So it's not easy to scale. Um, and it's, it's something where you just really have to you just have to be on top of it, of it every day and find out what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. What, 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 process. what was the biggest takeaway you think throughout that process? The, the biggest takeaway and it still is today, it holds true today, Tom, is people, you know, you have to find the right person um, that believes in what you believe and is, is going to make the commitment that, that, that you have made uh, to, to grow in this place. A lot of times, you know, that person is always asking what's in it for me today, you know, and there's not a lot in it for them today, to be honest, there's a lot in, in it for them tomorrow. And you have to make it worthwhile to that person for tomorrow. If you cannot find the people to, that believe in what you believe in to scale the business, you're not going to scale the business. It's not about process. It's not all of that stuff can get figured out because you're going to put smart people around that, right? Mm -hmm. All of that can get figured out. You have to have the right people um, believing in your business, believing in your projections, your strategy, your future, and your vision. And that's what makes all the difference. And it holds true today, too. Um, expanding upon that just a little bit more, like how, how do you go about finding the right people? Because uh, I constantly hear about the struggle to even just hire, let alone hire the right people. So mm -hmm. how, how do you tackle both of those challenges? Yeah. So the mistake I, I think a lot of folks make is, is they don't share the vision with them. They don't paint the, the picture, um, of what the future is going to look like. It's more, Hey, this is your position. This is what you're supposed to do day to day. And you report up to me and I'll tell you what to do next. They, you have to make them feel a part of the process. If you don't make them feel a part of the process and, and that there's something in it for them at, at the end, um, then they're not going to be all in either. So it's, you, you have to paint that canvas for them. You have to show them where you're going and you have to get crystal clear that this is how we're going to get here. And then those folks will buy it and they will want to be a part of it. And secondly, you have to have, you have to have culture around that. And what do I mean by that culture? Um, it means that they can't just be, they can't wake up every day and just go to a job and do the same thing over and over. They have to feel like they're a part of something. And that's not easy to do, right? Creating a culture. Um, and it's something that if you look at the big home improvement companies today, they have figured out culture. Every single one of them has figured out culture. And until you figure out culture, it's going to be hard to recruit people because what should happen in a, in a scaling scenario is 
that person that you hired is getting treated right. They see the vision and they tell the next person about the vision. And then they bring that person into the fold. And that's where things really start taking off. Yeah, that's helpful. It's a big thing in today's world, talking about yeah. hiring and building a good culture and all those things. I'd love to step back though a minute. And I know um, we you talked about canvassing a little bit in, your, in, in the beginning here about how you got started. Does Universal Windows Direct still do canvassing or have you moved away from that? I mean, what, what does it look like today for when we start talking about lead generation? So it's funny, but you know, that's how Bill and I cut our teeth is, yeah. is knocking on doors. We do canvas today, um, but because of the pandemic, we scaled back, you know, because nobody really knew what it looked like. Uh, it's very, it's a very, very tough business to scale or department to scale um, because you're knocking on doors, right? You talk about culture. That is a culture driven department and it needs constant, constant love and maintenance on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah, we still do knock on doors, but we don't knock on doors at the level we used to. Most of our advertising uh, is surrounded by um, branding, whether it's television or radio. Uh, we do a lot of lead aggregates. Um, in addition to that, you know, um, we have a call center where, where we're making outbound phone calls, but we do a lot of traditional advertising. We still canvas. Um, and what we're, one of the things we are doing differently today is we are exploring the world of, of social media um, and bringing in people who are advocates for, for the brand, you know, somebody who's built a large following and having them promote the business. But yeah, canvassing is, I would say, if I'm being honest, we're 20% we're of, of how Bill and I used to run it. How are you? How, I have, to, I have so many questions. Sure, sure. Keep how going. are you? How are you able to uh, pivot? I guess when the pandemic hit, from being canvassing to, you know, now all of a sudden having to generate leads. I guess in a in a different way. Was there was there already things in motion, and you just you know up the lever, up the switch, or how that what that look like? So we we were doing traditional advertising. It was part of the budget already. So we were doing television, radio, we, but canvassing was supplementing, you know, uh, a lot of those leads too. So it wasn't hard for us to make that transition because we were already doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, if, if the impression is that we were full canvassing before the pandemic, that, that that's not what we were doing. So we were sprinkling everything and canvassing was part of the, the advertising budget. So it was, it was difficult because in addition to canvassing, we call it guerrilla marketing, um, which, it, you know, we had shows and those went away. 20, 30% of our business was shows and canvassing. And when that went away, I think we all were like, holy crap, what are we going to do here? And this is why if you go on pay-per-click today and you search the word replacement windows, it costs, you know, $50 a click. Yeah. When, when we first started in the business, it was like $1.50. To, to click on the word replacement windows. Um, and everyone has kind of transitioned to, you know, fighting over those top three spots on Google today. Yeah, I'm also interested, you mentioned, um, you know, social media advocates, or maybe I'd call them influencers. <laughs> like, yeah. what does that look like in this space? It, it's, it's new and it's different and it's something that we're learning right now. Um, it's hard because most of your large influencers have a national feel right. to them. You know, they, right. they have folks that are your, from Europe or, or somewhere where you're not. So you, we, we use a platform to kind of control all of it. Um, and what we look for is somebody who has regionality to, mm -hmm. to their, their followers. And we'll pick those folks. Usually it comes with somebody that has at least a hundred thousand followers um, is, has garnered those followers through around the home space, whether it's decorating, you know, home improvements, something around the home space, but it's been very, very successful for us. And what I like about it most is there's a residual effect to it. So even when the campaign is over, we still get leads from it because of the past posts that, that the uh, influencer has made. 
And I think you're going to start seeing a lot, lot more of this in the future. In fact, um, we're exploring TikTok right now. And if you would have told me that we could get a lead from TikTok, I would have called you crazy. Yeah. And it's it's done very, very well for us. That's interesting. We've even looked at it, you know, here at Leap. Yeah, you know, I think they actually got, they have a TikTok. I, I think we were all shocked and surprised that it even came out of our mouth, TikTok. <laughs> well, and it's, it's, it's funny, like just being on the platform is one thing on any of these platforms, but really what you have to drive is the content. And what makes Universal Windows a little bit different than most home improvement companies is we actually have a content department. We have folks that do nothing but storyboard all day, film. You know, we, we have a, a photography director. We have a lighting person. We have an editor. We have, we have what you would see at a traditional advertising, um, you know, company working in, in, in our business. So if, you, if you're not good at speed of content, then it's going to be hard to be on those platforms. And you're going to waste money if you don't have good content. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. It, your social media influencer almost reminds me of like, uh, like a local radio personality, right? Like getting their endorsement, right, of, yeah. of your product. It, it seems like a very similar uh, type of person, but in a different. It's uh, actually it's 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 the same but different, Tom. Yeah. And and how it's different is they actually trust the influencer more than they do the radio announcer, because the radio announcer is paid at this point in the ball game it's hard to tell if this person is being paid for this or not. So it comes across as more genuine than it does from a radio endorser. Because everyone knows that a radio endorser is paid for, for promoting this. Yeah. This person on TikTok or, or Instagram, you don't know. Hey, she's just getting brand new windows installed from Universal Windows Direct and she wants to tell you about it. You know, and that's and then this organic conversation starts happening and it's so different than what we're all used to. Yeah. That's interesting. And how, how do you, how do you measure the success of that? Like they're not filling out a form right there, right? They're not like, no. how, how are you measuring the success of it? So that was one of the large conversations we had before we started this is like, guys, we're not going to start this and just measure it by, Oh, that lead came up from here. You know, we, we need to know, you know, everything that's going on from this influencer. And, and, and so we use a platform. Um, there are companies out there um, like Aspire or um, so, some of these other platforms. And they're actually, it's a growing segment um, where they'll represent the influencer and you basically have to go through them and they're brokering the deal to the influencer. But what they do is they'll, they'll help you uh, gauge where the lead came from and and see if there is conversion so it's it's getting bigger and it's a space that's really starting to grow right now yeah that's interesting we'll have to we'll have to have you back on in a couple of years and just hear how it's yeah. progressing and how it's yeah. going and it, and it, if, if you do have me back on i can bring back some some numbers and give you more details on it or maybe even have our our marketing director on to talk yeah. about it'd yeah it'd be it'd be interesting yeah i'm fascinated to hear sort of the new ways that uh, the businesses are, are, are getting leads and generating interest. You have to nowadays too, right? I mean, who's watching television? Yeah. You know, who's watching maybe the six o'clock news. You, you might catch somebody anymore, but nobody turns on traditional television at eight o'clock at night, you know, and this is where over the top advertising is coming into play too, where you can specifically target an audience, you know, based off of the platform that they're using. And it's completely different than 10 years ago where you just say, Hey, I got $20,000 here, tel television station. You know, how many leads did you get me? It, you're, you're targeting people now and, and you have all this data to figure out how you want to get in front of them. And usually it's in front of one of these that, yeah. that they'll see you from. Yeah. Yeah. We've you all got this. That way. Yeah. We've all got a phone in our hand. It seems mm -hmm. like at all times. Um, I'd love to know, you know, what are you most excited about? You got a lot going on. What excites you today? Well, what's exciting about today is, um, and you know this as well, is we've recently merged with uh, a company called Great Day Home Improvements. Um, they have a very large sunroom platform, uh, I think 50, 60 locations. Um, and then together we went out and acquired uh, Champion uh, Windows, window and door. So. Yeah. 
now under the Great Day umbrella, um, it's Universal Windows, Champion Windows, uh, Great Day Home Improvements, and Apex Energy Solutions together combined. And don't quote me on this today. You know we're between <laughs> six and seven hundred million dollars combined. Yeah. Um, so that's what excites me about tomorrow. Is you know we're really trying to position ourselves as the the, the number one brand. Um, as across the country when you think of home improvements. We have a lot of runway still. That's what's exciting. I, I should have I muted this. Um, <laughs> good thing I've got, of, edit, I've got an edit button, so we're good. You do. <laughs> we, we, we have a lot of runway still, um, so that's, that's exciting for us. Um, even if you look at all of, even Champion, for instance, you know, they've been in business 40 years. They still have a, a lot of runway left, believe it or not. The other exciting thing is, you know, with Champion on the team, you know, they, we're one of the few companies that can say we manufacture our own products, um, where other companies are relying on the supply houses or other manufacturers. So the, the future looks bright um, as long as the economy stays, you know, participates the way we want it to participate, then I think the, the future is exciting. Yeah. So I guess on, on the flip side, of that, I was going to ask you, you know, what keeps you up at night? Um, and I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's, you know, the unknown of what's happening in the economy or, you know, the uh, tensions across the globe. You know, I, what keeps you up at night? So there's a few things that keep me up at night. Um, one is em employees. You know, you're always, con you know, I think we have well over 2,000 employees now. Now I'm only responsible for a couple hundred of them, but still it's 200 employees that, you know, myself and our COO are responsible for. And I would say it's them making sure, you know, that they're happy, making sure that their families are taken care of, making sure that we're providing an environment where, you know, not only that they can make a living and, but also a place where they can realize their dreams. And I feel like if I don't do that for them, then we're not doing our job because at the end of the day, I mean, really we're selling home improvements here. This isn't rocket science, right? Really what Bill and I wanted to do is change people's lives. You know, when, when, when somebody comes to a home improvement company, they don't really think about this is going to change my life, but it does. It changes. I can't tell you how many people's lives we changed over the year where th they frown upon selling home improvements and now it's the best decision they've ever made so that's one of the things to keep me up and then obviously you know which way the economy is going to go and we're constantly looking at that um i do think the economy um has a lot of runway left is it is it going to be volatile absolutely but as you well know they they've pumped a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, into the economy with quantitative easing and that has a long way to make or to make its way through, so to speak. And I feel like it's going to be volatile, but it's going to be volatile up. Yeah. And fortunately, we have uh, what many would call a re recession proof product, because even if we do get into recession, folks are always going to look to save some money and, and invest in their homes. And Windows is one of the number one home improvement projects in America because it pays for itself over a period of time. So I feel like we're positioned well if the economy does well or doesn't. And um, but to answer your two questions, it's people and probably the economy. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know you're super busy when you're not working. What do you like to do? So when I'm not working, I are you are, are you ever not working? <laughs> never, never not working. I'm always working. It drives my wife nuts. Yeah. Um, even at 10 o'clock at night, I'm working. 11 o'clock at night, or I'm laying in bed watching a movie. I'm working while I'm You're watching thinking. a movie. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking. Um, so what I usually like to do is um, I do like to trade. So when when I have time, I um, I'll invest. I, mm -hmm. I trade options. I also invest in crypto. Um, I know for a lot of people, that's a bad word, but if you understand it, you, you realize there's not as much risk to it as everybody thinks. Um, and it's the future. Uh, so that's, and then as far as hobbies, I play guitar. So whenever I'm really stressed out, I'll just whip out the guitar and, you know, jam some Metallica or, or, yeah. or, you know, a folk song even. Yeah. Um, and then we, 
the, the number one thing the, that I do this for is, is to travel. Um, one of the recent trips that my wife and I took were to the Greek Isles. Oh, and nice. if you ever get a chance to go out there, it's just so beautiful. And, you know, you, you ask yourself that question sometimes, why am I doing this again? So somebody remind me why I'm doing this because I don't need all this stress. Right. And it's, it's for days like that or weeks like that, where you're just like, Hey, I can afford to be in the Greek Isles right now. And this is something that a lot of people get to do. So that's what I usually do with my time travel or, you know, just mess around with some trading. Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully the economy has been good to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <You're> okay. <laughs> As we wrap up here, I, I wanted to uh, just ask you, you know, for the listeners that are listening to this because they recognize uh, your name or the company's name and have seen the success that you've had, um, you know, and they're looking uh, at how they can grow and, and sort of realize their piece of that. W what advice do you have for them as, as they're trying to grow their businesses? Um, so we have a phrase at Universal Windows Direct. It's called constant and never ending improvement the best thing I can tell you is always set goals for yourself on a, on a quarterly, yearly and daily basis. Never wake up without a goal in mind. And what is your goal for today? And my goal for today is to do this or my goal for today is to do that. You have to have goals. If you don't have a, a goal, you don't know where you're going. Um, as far as, you know, how to do it, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that's in you. You, you, if you don't have the passion for the business to, to give it your all every single day, you probably shouldn't be doing this. You know, you should probably go get a nine to five job because that's who you are. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. Um, Cause I don't think you, I, I don't think a, a person can do what we do and, and not do it with passion. And if you look at somebody who's not succeeding, usually you can see some negativity, you know, they don't have a passion for it. They're complaining about something and they don't see an end vision in their head. So that, that's what I would say to, to them is, you know, wake up every day with a goal, do it with passion and you, you, you'll get there. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. It's great advice. Uh, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank you for joining. I appreciate the time. I know you're busy, and uh, I look forward to doing this again and following up on some of these uh, marketing techniques. Yep, and make sure everybody get, get Leap uh, because it's a wonderful platform. We, we, we've been with them now for a long time, and they changed their business. I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Appreciate that. All right, guys, thanks. All right. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Take care.